today. As the communities of St. Andrews, Presbyterian, and St. Paul's United gather, welcome to worship on this Remembrance Sunday. I invite you to please be seated. And let us join in our responsive lighting of the Christ candle today. The news is terrible. Even though we To live in fear, to live wondering if you are next, to wonder if you have anything left at home, family, neighborhood, or livelihood. We pray for the true peace to come to all the lands and all the peoples of us. May this light remind us of the God of peace. Let us pray. In a world torn apart by bombs and hunger, we pray in a world of competing ideologies, when the world sings the songs of consumerism and militarism, Shine on, light of Christ. Amen. Let us join in our intro. Next week, there will be jars at the back. 
if I get enough complaints, there might also be one that says, leave your hair brown. <laughs> and you get to vote with your quarters and your dimes and your loonies. And the one that is the greatest amount will win. And don't worry, it will all be gone by Christmas. <laughs> so be prepared next week with your change or your envelope that has your name on it so you can be tax receipted. Are there any other important announcements? There are none. So let us be called to worship this day. Today, on this day of remembrance, we come, recalling how divisions have led to death and destruction, recalling those who have stood up against oppressive forces, recalling the sadness and damage war has caused and the ways that it has shaped our world. Today, on this day of remembrance, we come to remember God's dream for us and all of creation, to remember Christ's grace and mercy, to remember that we are loved beyond imagining. So come, siblings in Christ, on this day of remembrance, let us enter into worship. see a few young ones. I'm going to invite you to come forward just briefly. Because on Remembrance Day, on Remembrance Day we do things, we do things differently. We do something we don't normally do. We have an act of remembrance. And in my box today, I have a copy. I have lots of copies because we didn't know how many kids there'd be. We put this over our left side, over our hearts, to remember. So I'm going to remember to pay like close attention to what's happening in the next few minutes. Because we're going to come back and we're going to talk. We remember before God all of this Remembrance Day events. We remember war, we remember people who died, and we remember people who served. And we do this because in times of sadness, in times of struggle, and in times that just seem so crazy, we need God's presence. We need God's vision to help us not repeat what we've done in the past. So I'm going to invite you to go back to Dad, and we'll call you back up later.
In a moment, we will hear a trumpet blast playing the last post. This piece of music traditionally was played at the end of the day. It signals lights out. Today it is played as a symbol of death and a reminder of those who have fallen in battle. Then we will enter into a moment of silent reflection, which will be broken with the revelry. The first call sounded in the morning, used as a wake-up call. Today, it signifies the hope and promise of the resurrection to Christ for those who have fallen.
not provoke, as we did are not provoke. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. If you require, please sit. But we pray. Loving God, let us not forget the costs of war, the lives lost, and the lives forever changed. May the memories and stories of those who have seen the violence and destruction firsthand be warnings to us of what we are capable of and of what we have to lose. Convict us, O oh God when we become complacent with the wars and violence that rage in our world still today, and drive us by your spirit to be workers for peace and harmony. This we pray in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And let us join in God Save the King.
When we are angry, when we are scared, when we are hurt, help us to come to you and find peace in you so that we can find better ways. And we get to say, O oh God, our help in ages past, as the Book of Praise, the Blue Book, number 330 today.
hear these words of promise and assurance. Jesus said, peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Friends, through God's mercy, our sins are forgiven. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and hold you so that we can live in the ways of his peace. Amen. And let us join in our son in prayer of illumination as we turn ourselves towards scripture. Behind it, and others see it as a novella. 
In the book of Jonah, in the book Jonah is sent to deliver a prophecy to the people of Nineveh, which is the capital city of the huge kingdom of Assyria. Assyria at the time was a huge nation that at some point in the history conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. The text does not talk about this wider context, but in the time of its writing, these, the text is often dated to the Persian period, which is the period in which the Jews and Israelis have, were sent off into exile and were able to come back into the land. Critical scholars do not believe that this story um, reflects what actually happened, but is a telling of important context. In our story today, there is a possibility that this story was written after the fact based on, or in this Persian period, based on writing cues and the theology of God. But there is a possibility that it speaks to a time prior to these events happening. As there is a reference to the prophet Jonah in 2 Kings. Within the Jewish context, this scripture is read during Yom Kippur in the afternoon. As we turn towards this prophet, let us be open what he has to say to us today. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittal, saying, <clears throat> Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind up upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came from the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the sailors were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, what are you doing here sound asleep? Get up, call on your God, perhaps the God that will spare us a thought so that, so that we may do not perish. Sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what, of what people are you? I am Abraham. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship back to them, but they could not. So the, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord. Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood from you. O Lord, 
have done as, as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered the sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out, of, out onto the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going by day's walk, and he cried out. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a, a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal, no, her no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Humans and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall, shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to, displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from punishment. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said in his right for you to be angry. Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a broth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush, but when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we reflect on this chunk of scripture, as God speaks to our hearts and minds through the music of our choral anthem, let us get
And so we pray. Holy God, speak to our hearts and our minds this day. Help us to connect the scriptures that we have heard with the world around us, with the lives we lead. Stir our hearts and our minds and our thoughts that they may be focused on you. Be for us. Continue to be for us. Our rock and our redeemer. May the words of our mouth, my mouth, and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. We hear a large chunk of scripture today. The full story arc of this Jonah narrative. And one of the things that I think is easy to miss is that Jonah is not just being asked to go to any city. He's not being asked to go to people who would be of like mind with him. God has asked him to go to the enemy. Like I tried to say it was in the story before the story, the context of which the story was written was the post-exilic period. So when people were able to go home after the destruction of the kingdoms, conquering of their space. But that there's a potential that the story was written about a time before all of that happened. There was one commentator that I read that said maybe this would be like to get the full breadth of how heavy it is, would be like a Jewish prophet going to Berlin before the Holocaust happened. And Jonah, like so many prophets before him, does not want to take that risk. Like so many of us who are given messages who do not want to take the risk. We don't know why it had to be Jonah. We don't know. The scripture doesn't say. In fact, in the book of Jonah, all we know is that he was a man from Tarsus, was sent to go. And so we went. There's a tension in today's text. A tension between a God who is universally compassionate and a God who is specifically oriented towards us. Jonah is upset. Jonah is upset at the end of this story, and even before, with the idea that God would be, or could be, or should be compassionate on the people of Nineveh. That God would be compassionate on the people who destroyed your homeland and uprooted you. reading from the time in which the scripture was written. I mean, that is a normal human experience, isn't it? When we are afraid and when we're hurt, when we're defensive, we want that God who is there for us. And we've seen that rhetoric played out in our media, 
what's been happening in the states and some of what's been happening closer to home. When we are hurt and afraid, we want, we need, we crave that God who is for us. But that is not the God who we actually worship. The God who we worship and who we know is the God whose compassion goes out in all directions even to those who we do not think deserve it. And that is one of the struggles of our faith at times. Because we are so human. In our scripture, we have all of these other players, the captain and the sailors, who have put and had experiences of God's mercy but have not put all of their eggs in the same basket. There's a good possibility that in the pluralistic society that they lived in they also acknowledged other gods. But for Jonah and Adonai his God was the only God. His way was the only way. And he wanted God to hold the Ninevites accountable. Have you ever had that experience? Been wronged or hurt by somebody? Held on to that grudge? Wished bad things upon them? We are human. The mercy of God, the mercy as big as God, hard for us to embody, and yet we are called to do this. To walk into that place of knowing that God's compassion and God's love is available for everyone. Not just those in our camp or with our specific beliefs. Even There's also something else about our scripture that I want us to hold up. Because Jonah, even in his doing the absolute minimum he could, walking a few steps into the city and saying, hey, if God's going to bring destruction on you, <laughs> even in those small words, we are encouraged to speak, to do and act in ways that help to bring about the vision of the world <coughs> that God desires. Because from Jonah's very small act of doing what God asked him to, we are told that the king and the people stopped doing evil and stopped being violent. And God's compassion came to them. What if our entire world 
stops doing evil, and stops being violent. The hope of our Remembrance Day would be realized. God's vision would be one amazingly large step forward. And so today in our scriptures, let us both hear that call from Jonah to stop and to repent. And let us hear that message that God's compassion is greater than we can imagine. Let us do everything we can in our own lives to stop doing evil and being violent in our words, in our actions, in our thoughts. And let us continue to speak out against the places where evil and violence continue to seek power in our world today. There are so many ways that we can do that. Let us not be silent. Let us not contribute to the wars and the threat of wars that are all around us. Let us instead call out for account and act in love. For that is the model we have in Christ. Amen. Let us join in our hymn of reflection and response, Amazing Grace, found in Voices United, 266.
Please be seated. Our scriptures speak of the generosity and the risks it involves, as well as God's faithfulness to generous actions. In this season of remembrance, <coughs> the risk and generosity of others is often on our minds. In the legacy of those who have gone before us, may they inspire us with generous gifts we present today. And so we pray. You are a God who cares for us in every circumstance. We thank you for your compassion and mercy, for your grace that comforts us in hard times and challenges us to expand our own compassion too. We long for your healing, O oh God, for our own hearts, when we are holding grudges, perpetuating divisions, and demanding vengeance. We long for your healing, O oh God, for this world where nations raise sword against nation, where nations divide against ourselves, where the vulnerable are seen as acceptable collateral damage where your creation is an afterthought. We long for your healing, O oh God, for those who think the world would be better off without them, for those whose energy is spent, and those who live with trauma, for those who have lost everything and see no way forward for those who have tried their hardest and it isn't enough and for all those who suffer in mind body or spirit we long for your healing oh god for your church meant to be a vision of your kingdom a beacon of hope Yet, too often a body coming apart at the ligaments and turning on itself, drowning out the voice of your spirit with our desire to win. Heal us from all that harms us, O Holy One. Set us on your path once again. Give us a bigger picture vision to see your care for all, all that belong 
belongs to you. The earth and heavens and all that dwell within. Remake us in your image, that we might live only for your glory. We bring all our prayers to you. In the name of the one who reconciles the world to you, and who entrusted us with that ministry of reconciliation. We long for your healing, O oh God, for all that is on our hearts this day. And so we pray in the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy work will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us join in our closing hymn, Let There Be Light, found in the Book of Praise, number 727.